Hi, I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. And it's been a bit of a break since the last uh, episode or last podcast. It's because, well, as I mentioned last week, I just had my second born child, my first son, uh, Sebastian Joseph. So we've been pretty busy here, though. Honestly, he's been an amazing baby. He just sleeps all day, sleeps and eats and uses the bathroom, let's say. And uh, the, uh, the bigger problem has been my two-year-old. So say a prayer for me about that. I saw the fathers that we may need to do a show about patience because that is definitely the virtue that I need to work on right now because my two-year-old is pushing it every day. But I'm really happy and honored to be joined again by Father Jeremy Saunders, who has been with us a few times on the show. So he's coming back. Thank you so much for joining us again from Canada. And for the first time is Father Augustine Waltz. I, I, wanted, I almost said Waltz because I'm so used to the German pronunciation. <laughs> it's a very German name there, Father. But um, we we're talking today about obedience and we want to talk more of this simple form of obedience. We talked a little bit before the show that you can go on about this really deep and you can talk about it forever in many different yeah, areas and different yeah, directions. But we want to keep it pretty simple, almost even based more towards children or very the basics of obedience, because I think that's where we want to start, right? And Father Augustine, I would love if you could tell us a little bit about yourself since you're new to the show. And then from that, you can tell us a little bit about your the obedience that you have to to that you owe to the bishop and that you owe to your order um as being a religious priest so if you can tell us a little bit about who you are and a little bit about being a religious priest that would be great yeah so i joined the cmri and i'm a religious priest under the cmri under the bishop under bishop Piverunus, and just um i uh, joined in 2011 i joined the seminary and uh, just a little bit about my background, I was kind of, uh, we did, weren't traditional right away, but uh, eventually we came to tradition. And uh, I had previously in 2008 gone and visited a seminary in Italy, uh, the Institute of Christ the King, and just visited, you know, just to see uh, discerning a vocation with them. And then I wasn't sure about it. And so I stayed with them six months over there and then I came back. And then I was just kind of in the world for a while. But then as soon as we found uh, Sede Vacantism and Bishop Piverunus in Omaha, I, I went and joined up. And uh, yeah, then the rest is kind of history uh, is for me. And then just um, as far as obedience, though, uh, it sort of seemed like me for me, the solution uh of my situation because growing up in the world and we know how the world is and uh, it, it helps you as far as religious obedience, you come under a common rule and you follow, you know, uh, a common set of rules of, of observations and different things. And so it, it's really helpful that, you know, you have a group of people that are all doing the same thing and, and working towards the same, same end. Uh, because as we know, you know, in the world, it it's you can be led any which way and that's uh with with obedience and coming under the common rule and joining a religious community you have that strength of the community to to guide you and i i thought that was uh what i needed as an individual uh, and it, it it really helps me knowing that i have that that support you know and that's why i think uh it's very important for catholic communities you know, it doesn't necessarily come under obedience, but to have that that support group of your friends and your Catholic communities uh, surrounding you to to really to really be that support to turn away from sin and the temptations of the world. Um, and, and, and do you so, think, Father? I'm sorry. Do, do you think that that's is that a personality thing that that makes it easier to be under obedience? Or I mean, because maybe that's an unfair way to phrase it, but I, I think that some people have a harder time with authority or obedience than others. Was that something that was easy for you from the start or? Well, for me, I, I don't know, I guess I'm maybe a little more easygoing. And so, yeah, I, I, I enjoy that, uh, that solidity. And I think it's, it's really the solution all around for people that, yeah, that need that direction, you know, then you can go and you can find that, that immediate direction, but then also for people that, you know, are, are very strong willed, yet it still gives them that great opportunity to practice virtue and to ascend, you know, the heights of, of spirituality, really uh, uh, giving giving that obedience. Because, I mean, that's the, the virtue is really about, you know, uh, the sacrifice of the will. And so we, we try to turn away from ourselves and we try to put on the new man. And and so 
it's um it, I, I think it's very beautiful for for everyone it may be more difficult for stronger willed people especially when sometimes things don't uh, really make sense to you but you you work at that and that's that's the virtue is you surrender yourself to okay this is god's will i mean it, and so that's that's what we we it all hinges on is is that submission and that and that's and i, I want to bring that since you brought that up i wanted to read real quickly from my catholic faith which is obviously i, I guess I, a catechism for for young kids um, and it says obedience consists not only in doing what is commanded by our superior but in being willing to do what is commanded one who grumbles and murmurs while doing what his mother asks him to do is not obedience. Not, not just your mother, father. So also, <laughs> also your, your superior. <laughs> and then it continues. Obedience is a virtue only when one subjects his will to that of another for God's sake, not for material or natural motives. Christ is the model of obedience for he obeyed completely and lovingly, even to the death on the cross. And I think that that's, that's pretty interesting that it is, Maybe that's not how everybody sees o obedience. If you really think of it coming from or doing it from also, I guess, in the, from the authority of God or doing it always for God, I guess that would maybe make it a little easier to swallow the, the yeah. humble well, pie, I suppose. Right. And as far as religious obedience, obviously, you know, that's that's what we're, we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, we're trying to really delve into that that spirituality of of christianity of really doing all for the love of god and that's what it all really falls under you know the 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 two laws the greatest commandments the love the your lord the lord your god with your whole heart soul and mind love your neighbor as yourself and so um but as, as far as children are are concerned you you keep mentioning them uh and that that's something i like to tell children is obedience ultimately that's what it is it's it's obedience to god and especially now you know doing these little things you know trying to see obedience in or trying to see the virtue in cleaning your room or doing your homework or you know the dishes or all these chores that your parents give you well it's even more about uh you know it is it is about that giving that obedience and that due uh respect to your parents but also forming that habit of being obedient to god uh, that, you know, first and foremost, I want to do what God wants, no matter what. And that's this, all this, you know, formation period is about that. And that's what uh, I think is, is missed by children, especially this day where they're given into all these, uh, media devices and different things. They, they don't think about, okay, what are we doing here? And now you're forming yourself, you know, the parent parents are forming you, you know, everything that you're doing is making a formation of uh, an indi individual that is giving back to God. And that's the purpose in life. And we we want to get to heaven. So we have to do what God wants. That's it's plain and simple. And so that's that's what we're doing here is is forming that that deep seated habit that no matter what happens in life, no matter who becomes president or who's in charge of me, my boss or anything. I'm going to do God's will, number one. That's that's the bottom line. And so that, I mean, I don't know. Hopefully that's helpful to children, but that's, I mean, uh, hopefully they can continue to realize that. So. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a really good point. And it's the same thing both for children, for adults, for priests, for religious, whatever, that, you know, it's hard to get through our heads that it's more what we do and how much love we do it with them than or sorry, it's why we do it and how much love we do it with than what we do. Yeah. And <laughs> that's a hard thing to get through your head. But if you can get that through your head, that makes obedience easier. Because, you know, if you're doing your own will, what you think is your own wonderful idea, or what you feel like doing, or you're doing your your parents' will or whoever your superior might be, you know, obviously as long as there's no sin in, in whatever we're talking about, where's the value? The value in is, is in how much love it's it's done with, and that's really the value. But it's it's really hard to get that through our own heads. That that's what gives it its value. You know, at the end of the day, if we're talking about the value as far as supernatural life goes, and the spiritual life goes, and heaven goes, it has nothing to do with what's done, aside from how that affects why and with what intensity of love it's done and self sacrifice and the practice of the other virtues. And it's really interesting because it's it's 
something that we've talked about in previous shows about the authority of the state also in the respect in a way that we owe them that that we are bound to obey the authority that we don't like now not when it comes to being sinful of course or if it's something that's that's not allowed for us to do but but like rebellion for instance is a really dangerous thing because because to rebel against proper authority it is it's it's against catholic teaching and, and it and so i think that you as you say that the whole feeling of it i think that's a so, so maybe i'll ask you father saunders should we also then have a non-grumbling feeling when it comes to say paying taxes should we say this is you know this is something i'm just going to take and it is coming from a proper authority i know that's it's maybe that's a tough question but but is that something we should also take on with a smile and with the proper intention we should take on whatever god's will is with a smile and the proper intention i'm going to skirt the taxes question there. <laughs> <laughs> we should i mean if it's got it's god's will generally speaking that we pay our taxes you know then why are we grumbling about it? It's, there's lots of unpleasant things we have to do. That we're, that we're you know, something. Um, and and that's what, yeah, this God's will, and it's beneficial for us that we don't like it. You know, whether it's paying our taxes or, like Father Augustine mentioned, cleaning our room when we're kids, whatever it is, you know, we have to learn to value those things that run contrary to our nature. If if there's, if there's nothing ever runs contrary to our nature, we're not going to make any progress. And that's one of the beauties of obedience is that it gives us something outside of us to run contrary to our nature. It's, it's hard to do that on your own, but with obedience, that, that really helps. And something interesting about obedience, I was just you know reading a little bit, just very quickly before the show started reviewing some stuff, is that you know, obedience, broadly speaking, it applies to everything we have to do, basically, right? The Ten Commandments, the all the virtues, et cetera, et cetera. But obedience as its own virtue is actually obeying because a person has authority. So it's not because necessarily uh, it's good for us, say in the case of a parent who orders their children to eat their broccoli, right? The virtue of obedience is the virtue of that child obeying because this person is their parent, not because broccoli is good for them. Yeah. That could be a virtue of, I don't know what virtue eating broccoli is, Father Augustine, maybe you know, but <laughs> sure it's fall under one of the virtues, temperance maybe, but... <laughs> But uh, that the, actually the, the respect for the authority. And so the sins against the obedience are sins. Uh, they can be a sin both against the respect due to the authority or the law and also a sin against the virtue. So the virtue of temperance in our case of, of broccoli. If there's any priests walk, watching that want to class that under a different virtue, they're welcome to come on and do so. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it makes sense, Father. And I, maybe I'd ask Father Augustine this. I mean, do you think the respect issue is a really good point, but I think it comes from both ends, right? That the, it seems like parents these days don't, they don't, not even, they don't push it, but they don't want to be on a different level than their children. They almost want to be equal with them and they don't, they don't want to have that respect level. I don't know if that's also a, a virtue in itself, but it is kind of on the flip side of it, right? That, that in order to be obeyed, you must want to be obeyed is that something that you've come across father or seen well I, I mean but the virtue would probably go past that and say you know that we we have we have this vocation we have this position you know and ultimately as authority comes from god you know it's it's again under obedience that we are in that position and uh, to strive to to have that proper relationship and so that's where, yeah, we get into, I think, uh, the parents nowadays, they don't command that respect like was uh, before. You know, parents, parents had a, a respect and you respected your parents and you didn't, you didn't, you know, speak out against them. You called them, sir, you didn't use their first name and, and different things of that nature, you know, and we're, we're slowly leading into those, those things of pr uh, respect to the, due to the parents that, uh, I don't think they they ask for. I don't think they command. And what I see, just obviously, it's not my vocation. I don't know all the ins and outs about being a parent, but um, it seems more parents are uh, want that friendly relationship with their children, and that's I think I think is uh, a grave danger to enter into that, where you you become just a friend. And then it more it more becomes a situation of being equals rather than being in that position of authority. And then then 
the respect is very in danger, you know, the respect due to that position. And so uh, I guess I don't know if I answered the question quite, but um, it just overall, I would say uh, parents need to have, you know, a fine line because then there's also parents that go too far in, in you know, making them subordinates, lording it over them, as it were. Um, and so I would say the, the parents should, you know, you, you have to find that balance of, of being, being friendly, but not being the relationship of a friend. So. And, and have either of you had that issue as priests with, with wanting to be friends, but also having to keep that, that distance that, that is required a priest to have? I imagine that must be pretty difficult. Yeah, I, I think I definitely have, have had that instance where it's like, uh, because I, I, I don't know, I kind of open myself up more with a friendly nature. And so that, that demeanor of authority isn't, isn't, uh, as exacting. And that again, goes to, uh, maybe my temperament or my nature as it is, you know, as a person, my characteristics, this being, being more friendly rather than being more exacting. So. I think it depends too. And probably goes for anyone in the position of, you know, you could say management or being a boss or there's parallels there. I'm sure where it's, uh, it definitely was a learning, a learning curve of, okay. You know, because also it depends to, to use the priest's example, it depends what exactly your position is. You know, we're all priests, but not all of us are pastors. Or I guess most of us are pastors, but you know, some places you have a senior priest above you. And so then he might be a bit more of that, that authority figure. And, you know, the, so it, it kind of depends, but definitely there's a learning curve there of, and that comes into, you know, that recognizing that the authority you have exists for the benefit of the people under you. I always tell people if, if you can keep that in perspective, I think that that really goes a long way to having the parents, you know, in the case of parents, uh, keep their self-respect and, you know, demand and command respect, not demand, but command respect, as well as be able to be friendly at the same time. You know, and you see that with uh, the popes that they sign documents, the servant of the servants of God. So the person with the highest authority is the greatest servant. And that's exactly what the Lord said. He is first among you, let him become the least. And so the more authority a person has, the more of a servant they become because they have that authority only for the benefit of the people under them. And if a person functions like that, then they gain the respect and, and the love and affection of the people who are subject to them. And because the people learn that, hey, this person's only got my best interest at heart and they're only using their authority. And if they understand that, even if they do it grudgingly sometimes, they'll still respect authority. Yeah. I think well, you see I think, that. As, uh, sorry, as I think Father Augustine said earlier, I think it's also it's shaping you're, you're forming children, especially. I mean, and I think also religious and priests, I mean, everyone is always being formed. I mean, <laughs> either for good or for bad. I think that's a really good point. And I think it's a really good point to remember, especially for children or for parents. I mean, again, I got a two-year-old and it's a really hard time to, to, you know, to say no and to punish her when she says no to me, because I don't, she's a little kid, you know, she's a little cutie. And it's like, where's the line? And it, it's hard. I can tell you, boy, I, I thought it'd be easy before I was a parent. And now it's like, this is it's a nightmare. It's so difficult. But, but it is, it's really important because you see, she needs to be shaped. She needs me to, to tell her, you know, what, what is right and wrong, what she must obey and what, mu what she must not obey. And it's, it's a big responsibility, but it is one of the most important responsibilities that any of us can have, I think, in, in shaping our children to, to respect authority. Because if they don't respect us, then they won't respect priests and, and they won't respect God and themselves, ultimately. I think that's a big issue you see in the world these days. I think any teacher can tell you that if the if the authority isn't respected at home, there's not much the teacher can do at school. You know, it's an incredible, incredible, even even the amount of the very large amount of time sometimes children spend with their teachers. The real the tone is really set by the parents. At least that's been my experience and through life that really depends what the person's home life was like. Uh, and yeah, with, you know. I, I don't envy you there, Kevin. That's why I like working with people who have the use of reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be glad to be there at some point because it is trying to reason with someone without reason is kind of like banging your head against the wall. That, that is the case. We'll come, we'll come back when your daughter's 13 and see how that <laughs> Right. Yeah, right. That'll, that'll be better. 
But to that point of formation as well, uh, this has come up a couple of times in, in thoughts of mine, just that parents are no less, and I think it was in, in, in the marriage classes, the parents have a vocation of raising saints to heaven. And I mean, it's a very beautiful vocation. That's, you know, that is your, your vocation. That's what you're doing. That's your uh, mission. And, and in informing them, it, you know, the importance of having that obedience ultimately to God and having that, uh, that under that respect due to authority, uh, that, all, all things come down. God allows everything that befalls us for our benefit, that we can live our lives to give back to God. And that's ultimately what it is. And so, uh, you know, with, with that, they, they can move forward in, in doing it out of love. Like when you have times where you have to discipline your children, you know, because you love them, because you want them to be holy, you want them to be a saint, you want them to elevate beyond this mere material world that uh, so many people have fallen a uh, victim of in our time. So um, I, I just would like to stress that, that it's, it's a very beautiful vocation and just to, you know, to, to realize the importance of it. That, and uh, I gave a sermon recently uh, just on, it was on Mother's Day on Mother's, um, talking about uh, just that, that the devil uh, attacks the family because uh, he he doesn't he doesn't want the heavens to be filled with men. He's very angry about that, as his sin was one of pride. You know, he wants to drag as many souls to hell as he can, and so he attacks the family, and so he attacks women and mothers especially to to drag them out of that role because he doesn't want that role filled properly. He wants he wants more of of a friendship role and everybody to to feel good. But you know, in that position of authority. That that's the weight of it is you have that responsibility to be the disciplinarian. But, you know, in your heart, when you're you're practicing it, it's out of love and it's out of, you know, your obedience to God and, and doing that due diligence to fill the heavens and populate the heavens that take the place of those fallen angels. So I, I, th I think that should also be stressed. Absolutely, Father. And I think from my perspective, too, it's something I've learned in the two years of being a father is that in order to be respected, you have to be respectable. And I mean, the kids see everything you do, everything you say, everything. I mean, everything. And, and so you have to be the example. Everything you do has to show them that, how can I tell them you know, to, to be good if I'm not? I guess if that makes sense. They have to see it first from me. And I think that's, it is a really big, yeah, it, it's hard. It's a big responsibility. But as you said, it's our vocation, right? That, that's That's, that's our goal, and it has to start with how we act. I mean, if we're if we're running around yelling at people or screaming or losing our temper, I mean, what are they going to do, right? What, what what do these little kids think about that? You know, they're they're going to go do it themselves, or they're not going to be able to have that feeling of of love and, and respect. So I think it's it's a hard job, but it, as I go through it, it, you learn more and more that that it is. You really got to be humble and and try to be a saint yourself, or you ain't going to re raise saints if you're not one yourself. Typically. Yeah. They tell those parents to stop laying on their back and kicking their legs in the air screaming. <laughs> no, say, guys, this isn't helping. <laughs> but I tell you what, though, oh after God. after the last few weeks with my daughter, I, I've been this close to doing that. I'm not, I'm not that's barely exaggerating. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I, I dropped by a parishioner's uh, place the other day, and uh, their the daughter was she's about uh, 12, something like that, but she's and but she was at a distance. And I thought for sure it was the mother. You know, she's just at that same height as her mother and everything about the child. Just replicate, you know, their, their walk, their gait, their mannerisms. You know, I'm sure that mother never told them, you know, you should walk with your shoulders bent just this way or with just, with this posture. And you should use these kind of hands gestures. And, you know, like you're saying, the kids replicate more than by what you tell them, by how you act, how it's behave. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so Father Saunders, I'm, I'm going to switch topics a little bit, same topic, but a little bit different area, and ask you, and maybe not why you chose to be a secular priest, but why, what, what's the, the difference, or what's your, what's the word, how, how much obedience do you owe Bishop Pepperunis, who, of course, ordained you a priest, but you are not technically directly under, or, or you don't have to owe him obedience, is that right? 
I, I think he's trying to escape the issue here. Oh, well, that was good timing. Good timing to freeze there. <laughs> oh man, father, father froze right when I asked him a tough question. All right, let's bring him back on. But maybe we'll just have to. We'll have to ask uh, Father Father Augustine can answer for him. Maybe. <laughs> so Father Augustine answered for Father Saunders. Why exactly? <laughs> did you yeah. did you hear the question, Father Saunders? I did, and that was not deliberate. If the bishop watches this, that was not on purpose. <laughs> I heard the yeah, yeah, yeah I, I was still talking over here. I didn't freeze for myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably me. Uh, yeah, no, I do owe obedience to the bishop. I am directly right. on him. And, but it's in regard to my priesthood. So as part of the ordination, ordination ceremony, actually, where the, uh, the priest puts his hands inside the bishop's hands, and the bishop closes his hands around yours, and he says, do you promise me, me and my successors obedience? And you say, promito, I promise. And uh, we actually had a bit of a funny thing at, when we were practicing for my, my ordination, myself and a couple of the other priests, because uh, Bishop Everunas had a heart attack the week before my ordination. We were on retreat, and thankfully he's well recovered from that. Um, but Bishop Davila graciously came up and did their ordinations for us. So we're, you know, we're going through the, the practice for the ordination. We get to the Promito part, and Bishop Peruna says, says to the assistant priest, make sure they <laughs> make sure they promise obedience to me, not to Bishop Davila. <laughs> right. we had to, we had to use, use the proper wording in the ceremony. Right. It's to your bishop. You know? Uh-huh. So, Interesting. Got, got, got a chuckle from everybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. So my my vow of obedience, you could say, or my promise of obedience in the ceremony, uh, like Father Augustine's, the religious, theirs extends to everything in their life. Right? Every aspect of their life uh, is then the vow of obedience. For the secular priest, it extends to everything concerning my office as a priest. So what you could call private affairs, you know, I suppose if I wanted to hang a certain picture on my wall, the bishop, I, I suppose my, my promise of obedience wouldn't extend to that. Now, if he asked me to, I, I would. <laughs> but but for Father Augustine, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the, that can be regulated, like what your private thing. So it extends to every, generally speaking, it extends to everything having to do with my office as a priest rather than to every aspect of my life. And so if, if the bishop said, Father Saunders, pack up, you're going to Africa, then you would have to obey and go to Africa. And yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, huh. yeah, I didn't know that. Just learn, learning something new. In uh, we'd say ordinary times. I mean, th these are a little unusual because in ordinary times, the bishop who you promised obedience to, his authority would be within a confined right. diocese. Right. So sure. Here, and then you have their. And so in, in in normal times, would that have been? Could that have been transferred then? If, if say you, if the priest left the diocese of his bishop, he would go then into the obedience of the other bishop uh, yeah but you'd need permission from both ends it's mm -hmm. called incardination when a when a priest is taken under the authority of the bishop it's called incardination mm -hmm. into the diocese so uh -huh. might... and is it is it something that you are you know are you signing something or promising something again or um i'm supposed there would, would have been something formal to it because it had to be clear you know because sure. the church, church is very very well structured and there's and in the ecclesiastical life obedience is key and so it sure. had to be clear who you were obedient to. As a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> when you're ordained, you have to have what's called a title. Getting off a little bit in the weeds here. But no, they, awesome. you, have have, you have to have a way of being supported because there was a point in history, believe it or not, <laughs> when priests were being ordained with nowhere to work, nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. and so they had vagabond priests. They had wandering priests. Wow. Uh, and so the church regulated and said, you have to have it. It has to be arranged. Whose authority, who you're functioning under, who's supporting you, before, um, before you're, you know, you said it before you're ordained. Makes so, sense. Yeah. But that's incredible. I mean, it's an amazing thing that we, we all grew up obviously far after the changes where, where the, the church is no longer the church as we know it, where we're all kind of, kind of wandering around trying to do the best that we can. It's incredible to, to remember, to see what, what the church is or should be. I mean, that the regulation and, and all the rules and then the see how we have to just kind of go by the shoestrings now. That's that's a pretty big difference. It's phenomenal. I mean, you look at canon law, it's beautiful. The order, the organization, and the the wisdom that went into it, absolutely incredible. I mean, just just from a just from a human perspective, you could say it's it's absolutely amazing. And to think that these men function over the entire world, every nationality, 
for 2000 years with respect for civil authority and proper balance and organization and obedience. It's really, really cool. And I was just going to add to that, but it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's not just laws and strictness. It's for the good of souls. It's all for, you know, it's all for to keep man from his fallen human nature and to help him to overcome it. And that's, you know, back to the point of parents and that, you know, that's, that's what obedience is. It's, we want to subject ourselves to God because we know the alternative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the, the rules, I, that's, that's one of the beautiful things I find from the church that many say Protestants would complain about it. There's so many rules and you have to do this, this, and this. It's like, well, yeah, but I mean, what's the goal, right? The goal is heaven. And if these rules help us go to heaven, <laughs> then, I mean, does, is that, isn't this a good thing? And, and I think when I, the more I learn about the faith and about the, the rules and about what the church teaches us, it all also practically makes sense. I mean, I mean there, there is a reason. Look at society. Again, when society you know, starts to fail in terms of obedience and respect, society starts to fall apart. And there are many other things society is falling apart with, obviously. But, but you know, look at the family. Look, look, at, look at everything's a mess. Look at, look at mental health disorders. And a lot of it's because, well, maybe they didn't have a father or they didn't have a mother or they didn't, you know, they didn't have a proper household and a proper family dynamic. And people, you know, look at the church like, oh, you have too many rules. It's like, well, yeah, look, look what happens when you follow the rules. You have a happy, healthy family, a happy, healthy society. And, and, and they just the devil tries to trick the world and the people of the world to think the opposite. And the cat tries to trick them, too. Right. I, I saw a beautiful, a beautiful um, illustration recently. I can't remember what topic. I think it was about um, the relation of the church and the Bible to science. And it was perhaps there's the biblical commission and on, on, on Genesis. Anyhow, whatever it was, and I think it might have been one of the popes that used this illustration. They said it's like a canal. If you set boundaries to water, it'll have a lot more force because it's all heading in the same direction. Whereas if you have no boundaries, all the energy is just dispersed everywhere. And it's likewise with with the church and with the laws of the church and with God's laws that if we stay within the boundaries established by law and by good law, then society actually becomes more productive, more successful, more, uh, you know, more of a success on the whole, because the energies are no longer wasted, wasted in doing things which are immoral and, you know, consequently a waste. And I thought that was a really neat illustration. I think the same thing goes with the child, you know, you may think, well, just let your kids do whatever you want. Well, they're going to waste so much of their time and their energy. Uh, just doing whatever they want. And someday they're going to be, you know, 30, 40 going, I wish my parents would have shown some discipline. You know? So that now that I'm at this point, it would have benefited from all that energy has has had as a child. Oh, That's a great point. And I, I mean, when, when, when I, when you see how the world again, trees say that, say that the, the dark ages, right? The dark ages, you know, they're in the time of Christendom and, and they, Oh, even the movies show it in like practically black and white, right? It's always dark and dusky and kind of gross looking. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then you see the movies today and it's bright and clear and everyone is smart and intelligent. It's like, well, look, look at the architecture. That, that always strikes me more than anything else. Look at the architecture. If you come to Europe and walk around for a minute and see the things that were built in the 1200s that still stand perfectly and look amazing. And then you look at the garbage that we're building daily. It's just like, you just see again it, it all works together that this this idea of yeah being in it for something else and these structures also worked and were built because men put god ahead of themselves and put the society ahead of themselves and it's now everything's quick and fast and how do i get it as soon as possible because they put themselves ahead of everything else and i think that further generations are going to look back and say you know the dark ages well and let's see uh 1900 until you know, <laughs> yeah yeah if you make it that way if you had uh if you had no cell phone and no internet how easily could you find the guy who knew how to make a stone arch that would stand up isn't that something to think of too at that time when all that knowledge spread no communication technology sure your best was a leather guy on a horse with a leather oh, pretty neat right yeah but, but I think one important thing to emphasize is that the internal, you mentioned it right at the start when you read that quote, the internal aspect of obedience. You know, there's external obedience and then there's obedience of obeying willingly, even though we might not particularly like the idea. And then there's the obedience that even goes so far as not only uh, 
obeying cheerfully, even though we don't like the idea, but actually conforming our judgment to the judgment of a superior. That's the deepest, one of the deep, deepest form of obedience where we actually go, okay, I don't, my, my judgment on this matter, obviously we're not talking about something sinful or teaching in the church or anything like that. My judgment on this matter is different from say my superior. I will agree with their judgment. Yeah. And so that's a real, a really, uh, a deep form of obedience. And, and that, I'm sorry. I, I just said it's a really good point because I think it comes up a lot and I, I, I don't think we want to get into too touchy topics here or anything, but I think it's, it's a really good one that comes up to me again about Pius XII and those changes. Again, I'm not trying to start a fight here, but but that really makes sense because I think that that's the obedience that even if we don't like it, I, I grew up at a at a church that did the pre Pius XII rubrics and I liked them. I I I I guess I could say I prefer them, but but now I'm with a CMRI priest and I'm with a bishop who who absolutely follows Pius XII in obedience. And I absolutely follow my priest and the bishop in obedience. And you know, I'm not gonna grumble about it, even if you know. I grew up otherwise. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to remember too. And I guess it gets really difficult as you get into, yeah, doctrine and dogma and what you have to obey and whatnot. We'll save that for another show. We'll, we'll, we'll bring on a couple of the, the, the older priests as the, as the, the heavy hitters for, for that one. But it's a, it's, it's really a, a really interesting topic, I think. And um, do, do we want to go into, a, we've already gone 36 minutes. It's pretty amazing. Do, do we want to talk about the limits of obedience where to be careful? What, what what do we have to know? You know, where we don't have to obey. Is it is it simple enough just to say, don't do anything sinful? Father Augustine, maybe you want to answer that one. Yeah, uh, I would say you know, with, with obedience, we we want to we want to always be pleasing God, obviously, in, in everything that we do, and that's where I guess when when you get into withholding obedience. You know, you, you have to discern, okay, is it something that's obviously dangerous to to the body? You know, even even in, in those situations, you know, that, that would be still under the, the under sinfulness. And so that's that's where, you know, we, we don't we don't have uh, a, com a complete blind obedience, but we we still you know, we don't we don't lose our rational nature. We don't lose you know, reason. We don't just throw that to the wind. We, we use our reason. Everything that we have is a gift from God to be used for his glory. And so uh, as, as far as, you know, when we have to withhold obedience, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's why we always, we always point to, okay, something that, that would be sinful. And I think even under that would be something that does uh, harm to body or somebody's life or their reputation you know, th those things as well, uh, I, I think, would come under that. Uh, Father Saunders, you want to add anything to that? I think just generally speaking, like you said, we don't want to get too particular. And the, the reason for it, that is, is that it can be easily misunderstood because it, it can get into a lot of details. But um, I think that another important aspect is that each authority has its domain, right? And so there's a limitation not only uh, from the aspect of whether we what where how far does obedience extend, but there's also a, a limitation on the aspect of how for, how far does authority extend. And just a really simple example, you know, I'm in the states and or I'm in Canada, and Father's in the states, so you know the president of the U.S. has no authority over me, but he's in he's in that country, so there's authority there, right? So there's there's physical limits, there's moral limits, etc. So that's something I think as well to consider. And then yeah, like Father said is harmful or uh, sinful. And, and also I would say um, that a person can end up in situations where they have pretty severe qualms of conscience about obedience, because sometimes you end up with people wielding power who shouldn't have it, who abuse it, who misuse it, that type of thing. And I would say consult a competent priest uh, because they don't want to give anything that's going to be misunderstood. But, uh, you know, I, I know, I know of instances where, people suffered for many years and then they were finally got the direction and the, and the instruction they needed on, you know, on the obedience in their situation. So it's not a free. Yeah. And I think that, that that's really nice that you said, because I think that it is, there are a lot of things that are very complicated. You can't cover it in a podcast. You can't just blanket statement, everything. I think that that's important to remember. I mean, it's important to remember why we have the church, why we have priests and bishops that they're to help us, right? They're, they're our guides, our shepherds, 
to, to heaven. And obviously, of course, to offer the sacraments as well. But they're also here to, to give us this advice and, and personally and privately. I think that that is for these types of touchy topics is a better idea in general than, again, you know, laying out uh, judgment uh, on, on a on a YouTube video. But no, I think that's that's well said, Father. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that covered it well. I, I really I really appreciated how we how we started more towards the kids, because I think if we approach it more simply, maybe it'll be easier for us to. I don't know, to follow, to comprehend. I mean, I, I, I find that I, whenever I read my Catholic faith, I feel a little more comfortable in my faith. Honestly, it's a kid's, I know it's a kid's catechism, but it makes me a little bit more like, wow, okay, you know, I do kind of need to know this, this basic stuff that I haven't read in 20 years. And it's a uh, highly recommendable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the, it's the truth, right? Whether it's written simply or at great length. It's the truth. And if you base your behavior on the truth, then you're going to have peace. So it's, it comes down to that. I also Absolutely. just want one more. Um, of course. Uh, that's a, when it comes to kids and motivating them to obey, it really stuck with me. I remember when we were studying moral theology in the seminary, it said, never underestimate how high a motive a small child can be motivated by. So don't think that just because they're little, they can't be motivated by the salvation of souls or by, you know, saving souls from, from going to hell or, by making up for, you know, the, what hurt Jesus and stuff. the kids, kids can be motivated by the highest spiritual motives that there are. And they're actually, in some cases, maybe more capable than us. And you see that with our lady, right? Who would she come ask reparation for? Lucia Jacinta. Yeah. So that, so with your children or with anybody's children, with, for parents with their children, remember that your ki children are capable of very high spiritual motives. And I think that goes back to, you know, uh, the, the seeing the the catechism and it, it, how it's the truth and it's it can be it's very simple and anybody can understand it but yet it can it confound the most complex minds and uh, I think that's that's uh, how also we have to know ourselves and to develop our own spirituality based upon that okay are we simple keep it simple you know don't don't try to uh, you know, overextend yourself and study all these complex, complicated things, form your relationship to God, especially under, okay, he is the supreme being that I am trying to uh, submit myself to, that I'm trying to uh, give myself to. And, you know, this is, this is life. We're, we're not here for the world. We're not here for our own personal gain. We're here for God and we're here to give back to him. And, you know, that demands obedience in itself, that he created us, he gave us this whole world, this whole place, and we, we owe it to him to use it properly in the way that he has designed and the way that he wants. And that's, that's the, you know, uh, I think the, the base, the foundation of all the issues of man is, you know, even with the devil, what, that, that's pride, that he turned away, you know, he began to be disobedient because he saw himself as, you know, uh, an, an end that he didn't want to he didn't want to submit to God and so in that pride he fell and that's that's where that's the beauty of obedience it draws all things to God all things because that's where all the authority comes from that's where all uh, uh, our human uh, success goes to is is to God that we give glory to him perfect father I think that's a perfect place to to end the show um, I, I guess I, I, I always go back to each one to see if anyone has any last words. So, Father Sanders, I'll ask you first, do you have any last words? To add that, that was a great place to end it, so it, good I luck. Think, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Then, Father Father Augustine, do you have any last words, anything last to say? Again, that was very well said. Just, uh, I would say, you know, to children, again, don't hesitate in your obedience. Be as immediate as you can. And I guess that goes to everyone. Just, you know, the longer we hesitate, the more we think our mind gets in the way of just submit to God and, you know, be pleasing to him. Great. Fathers, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on. Anyone who enjoyed this show, please like, share, and subscribe, comment, do all of those fun things. We always love having the priests on. If anyone has any recommendations or, or shows they want us to do, don't get too in the weeds with stuff, guys. We're talking more catechism level or something interesting. It's something that, that you would like a priest to talk about. Please email me at kevin89davis at gmail.com. So again, to Father Saunders, Father Augustine, thank you so much. And until next time, God bless.